Ian Mitchell. I'm uh, from the University of British Columbia, one of the co-organizers for the Reproducible Research uh, Workshop. If you're not in the Reproducible Research Workshop, then you're in the wrong room. There are, in fact, at least five other workshops going on. Um, so uh, we're going to get started with our first talk by John Wilbanks from the Creative Commons. And I'll let John take it away. So thank you, Ian. Um, also, thanks, Randy and Victoria, for the invitation. Um, and I'm only going to be here for a short time, and I'll, I'll show you why, because uh, I've got this guy at home, and I have to go home as fast as I can, um, because one night alone of my wife feeding him means that I have to go home very quickly. Math, it's, a, it's a function, right? It's a certain, it decays very quickly, um, the patience, as, as I'm gone. So I apologize for that, so I'll only be here a short period. Um, so. I work at Creative Commons, and usually when I get asked to speak, the reason I get asked to speak is, is to talk about openness or to talk about freedom in the context of free culture and free software and, and all of that sort of stuff. But um, I've worked with Victoria for, for years now, and th through her and through sort of seven years of throwing my body against the walls of science, trying to make it open and getting nothing but bruises out of it, I've started thinking that it's not about freedom in the political sense, but it's about f the freedom to reproduce work, which is a very different concept of freedom. And so in my world, when people talk about freedom, they mean it in sort of a revolutionary political context. So free software is a political act. Free culture is a political freedom, right? It's free as in speech. But the, the thing is that that's not very effective at convincing scientists to put their data online or to put their code online, because scientists aren't scientists because of Che, or because of Stallman, or because of Larry Lessig, or because of me. Right? They're scientists because they're interested in the pursuit of knowledge, typically, and then they're bound by the traditions of science. They've got to go get funding and get a job and get tenure so that they can host workshops, they create papers, they get more tenure. And so this whole frame of, of revolution and freedom is actually sometimes actively harmful to getting science to be shared and more reproducible. So my, the first point I'll make is that talking about reproducibility is better than talking about sharing, for the most part. When you're talking to actual scientists, when you're talking to citizens right, or politicians, sharing can be very powerful. But if you don't speak to scientists in the language of scientists, they often are resistant. Um, now, here's why reproducibility is important. So this was a story from last week. I was actually at a meeting with the head of the Duke clinical system uh, when this came out. Uh, and Victoria e emailed me immediately, which is, this is about a uh, study done at Duke that found a certain pattern of genetic variations correlated um, to uh, cancer treatment, sort of a, a susceptibility to a cancer treatment. And so they got very excited, and they rushed a test to market that would test you and see if you had the pattern of genetic variations, right, the individual mutations that make my eyes blue or my hair brown. Uh, they wanted to find out, basically, we can use this as a test. We can sell it, and then we can stratify patient populations very quickly. Um, now, it turns out that they didn't share the data that underpinned their assertion that these genetic variations actually stratified the patient population. And patients died as a result of this because the variations turned out not to be predictive of what they were supposed to be predictive of. of. And these are the two guys who actually went back and reanalyzed the paper. And there were basic things like columns in the Excel spreadsheet had been swapped that were essential to the analysis. But they had to go basically rebuild all of the data and figure out that the research wasn't reproducible. So in the sciences, this isn't sort of like a joke, right? People died because that research wasn't backed up by the code and the data underneath it. Right? Because they went to market with a test based on a paper, right? four papers from that lab wound up being retracted because they weren't reproducible and in fact they were wrong. Right? And the guy who was the lead author on them has hired a re an online reputation management firm so I assume that I'm going to get into trouble if I use his actual name. So I'm not going to say it but you can Google it and find the New York Times story. Uh, but this is the reality of, of non-reproducibility in the biological sciences, is that people can actually die. Uh, because there's such a high sort of decision space, you can find lots of correlations in the genome to lots of things. Um, and if you're not very good at math, like me, you can assume that those correlations are significant, right? 
and start to assert to patients that they should use those correlations to make decisions about their health care. And so there's a direct line from math and biology and reproducibility to people dying in this case. So this is the sort of thing that ideally you can talk to both a politician and a scientist about. And this is why reproducibility is more important. It's not about the scientists should share their data because it creates political freedom. It's about the scientists should share their data because otherwise people might die because they're going to make decisions about their health care based on the assertions made in a paper. Um, you also find evidence for the importance of reproducibility outside computational sciences and math. So this is from Alan Edwards at the Structural Genomics Consortium. And what you see is, uh, this is a graph of citations. These are all nuclear hormones, right, in the genome. And so uh, despite the fact that there are lots and lots and lots of nuclear hormones, there's a power law that dictates which ones get cited in the literature. And that power law correlates to whether or not there's actually a chemical probe that lets you perturb those receptors in the genome. So if you can chemically reproduce an experiment, because you can actually buy the reagent and run the experiment, you're a lot more likely to do the experiment. And so despite the fact that all of these are actually probably awesome drug targets, there's been no papers written on them, because if you did, no one could reproduce the experiment unless you shared the reagent with them, the physical reagent. So reproducibility exists in the physical space as a really important factor as well. And it creates a bias against exploring unexplored parts of the genome in the life sciences. And so you know, Al is, is a great guy. He's in Toronto and has basically said, what we need is a $500 million project to create open chemical probes right, for the dark matter of the genome so that we can rapidly reproduce those experiments and start building citations and papers on them. And if you graph the patents, the patents follow the exact same curve. Right? It's actually amazing. So reproducibility is, is a current under this Right? And what we're trying to do at this workshop and what Victoria and others are trying to do is to make that an explicit part of the conversation instead of an implicit part of the conversation. I love getting pop-up ads while I give talks. So the, the other way to think about reproducibility is as a form of collaboration. Uh, and again, this is why I think it's a better phrase than sharing. Uh, because sharing sort of implies that the only thing that's important is to post something not about what happens afterward when someone comes in and reuses it. So a lot of people in my space use the example of this thing called the virtual choir as an example of collaboration. So this composer sent out an email and said, please sing and record yourself singing a part in my choir and then I will do six months of post-processing basically by myself uh, and synchronize them and publish the results. To me, to me this isn't collaboration. It's basically free labor. Um, and one guy who's got a really awesome right, post-processing Pro Tools system. Um, and I, I work with an org called Sage Bio Networks, which is very similar, which says we want to get data from lots of people, but then one or two scientists or a group of scientists will put those together into a model. And then we'll use the, 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 the model to predict which genetic variations predict response to a disease. Sort of like the Duke stuff, but the idea is that we're going to make it open. But it's not actually collaboration in this context. It's more, again, crowdsourcing the free data so that you can then start to do really awesome math in it. And the big difference between this and Duke is that everything at Sage is going to be open so that the work can be checked. Right? So that the work can be reproduced because the models are never done. The models simply can only get better. They're never complete. And the, the, the far more interesting question is things like World Opera. And I, I point out how bad their branding is that the first line on their paragraph is, you may not have heard about World Opera. Uh, but these guys actually are trying to do collaborative real-time opera performances. And it, 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 I bet the guy is hilarious. He tried to pitch telemedicine to the Norwegian government. They're like, no, 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 we want to do that opera thing, which would never happen in the United States. Uh, but they have to face these very real questions about how do you deal with latency, how do you deal with whether or not you have a conductor or a metronome or an avatar, right? How do you reproduce a performance Right, of a piece of musical work when everyone's in a different room, in a different country, in a different time zone. And so if you think about the importance of the score being open, right, of a, the agreement on the standards of the, how we score the information in music, you start to get at how hard it is to do collab real collaborative science. And we're not going to solve it. A lot of people are trying to force it. But the sort of first element of collaborative science is, is reproducibility. So you can't even start to have a world opera until you can reproduce the score of the music the same way. And so imagine that in the scientific world, we're talking about the equivalent of having world opera when we don't even have bass clef and treble clef 
and we don't have agreement on what the time tempos are. And so sharing your data, making your data open and available for reproducibility purposes is the step one towards even getting to, to, to this level of stuff. And so, you know, I do work at Creative Commons. One of our mottos is, I love to share, but if I'll end the first section of the talk by pointing out, this guy's not a scientist, right? So when you talk to scientists, it's not about sharing. It's a, I think it really has to start with reproducibility and reuse. You know, reproducibility is important because people can die, right? And reuse is important because it increases your impact as a scientist. And so if we focus just on posting it, Right, that's just step one, but step two is that people actually do something with it. So um, this workshop is about best practices. Um, you're going to hear way too much about best practices over the next day or two, so I am going to focus on a couple of little things. So uh, I know Randy here is the guy you ask about the NSF, and I apologize, but I am going to classify the National Science Foundation's dissemination and research data sharing as an old school approach to sharing data because it assumes that all science is done through grants to institutions uh, and that that's where most of the data comes from. It also assumes that scientists know how to disseminate and manage their data uh, or that libraries at institutions know how to help them do that. Now we are fumbling our way towards that um, but you know, I've, I've gotten enough phone calls from confused scientists from anthropology to biology to chemistry to physics saying yeah, you know, does this mean I just have to have a website where I put up a tar file? Um, does this mean I have to put up my code, right? Is it okay if I use R? Is it okay if I use MATLAB? You know, do I have to document my code? You know, my model doesn't work all the time. Do I really have to share it, right? These are, I mean, none of these are, are made up. Um, and so the, the sort of idea that funder down driven mandates uh, are the key is old school. They're very, very important. They're one of the single most important tools we have because they create sort of blunt force trauma against the investigator if they don't comply. And they create the funding that hopefully the libraries will be able to use to provide resources back to people like you to make research reproducible. But it's very old school. And the other thing that's old school is that if you're doing research that involves human subjects, you typically have to deal with a research ethics board. So this is the uh, ethics board for here at, at UBC. I pulled it down last night. Um, so if you're doing anything that involves surgery, clinical interventions, exercise programs, or the analysis of clinical data, um, and in particular, the interesting stuff here if you're a mathematician is uh, medical records are studies involving the linkage of data from existing databases. So a lot of the interesting math that happens in my world happens by connecting existing databases and running sort of backwards retrospective analyses to see you know, was this drug effective or not? Right? What variations in the genome associate with people responding to the drug or not? What variations in the genome associate with having the disease or not? And at what level and what progression? Uh, so so the, the sort of old school method assumes that there's big money involved and that institutions are both the host of the data and the host of the scientist and the host of the research. And that's increasingly not the case, right? So. The new school of, of, of best practices uh, sort of starts from the principle that you need to make things open. So these are the Panton principles, which says if you publish an article about science, you need to make everything required to reproduce that research from a data perspective available. It's not requiring you to give your data away before you publish, but it says if you make a claim in a published paper, you need to put the data into the public domain so that it can be reproduced. Now, I'm going to criticize this in a second as insufficient, but I do think it's an important first step. Um, what's missing here is the code needed to understand the data. Right? So the data without the code or without the provenance of how the data came to be processed right, are not enough. Um, there's also a lot of work going on. Now this is an NSF funded project that I still think of as New School, which is DataCite, which is saying you also need to create citations to the data itself. So it's not enough, again, just to reproduce the research so that someone can come in and validate or criticize your paper. You would like them to ideally build on your data and your code, and that means they need to be able to make citations directly to it. Most of our citation culture is based on the idea that you have a paper, which is a funny word right, in the digital world, and that you have supplementary materials, when in fact the supplementary materials are often the bulk of the research. And the paper is sort of like a Polaroid of one dimension of the research at one moment in time. 
So coming up with ways to create citations to data is another way to create incentives uh, beyond non-reproducible equals people die, right? Non-reproducible equals people die is a very good way to get you shocked in the morning before you've had your coffee. But on a day-to-day -day basis as a scientist, you want citations because they help you get tenure, which helps you get grants to have workshops, right? And data site is a piece of that. Um, another way to do it is to actually create new journals. So this is something that I'm working with um, Eric Schott, who is a, uh, a network biology modeler, and some other folks. We started a journal, Victoria's on the editorial board, uh, which actually only publishes models and data. And you can actually go and get someone else's paper that they published in a journal if they used a mathematical model of genetics. If you extract that model in the data, we'll publish it and give you a citation for that. If you publish your own model, we'll give you a citation for that. But the idea is that for any paper that makes claims using network modeling about biology, this is a place where you can actually extract and publish those. And we're going to give rewards to the people who do the work, which is citations that tenure review committees understand. So this is a Biomed Central journal. It looks just like a regular journal. It's just that we take things that aren't articles as first order research objects. Um, and you'll hear, I'm sure, about this from Tony Hay tomorrow. Right? Even companies like Microsoft have realized that there's actually a business to be made in going in and cleaning up and making data available to third parties. Because data has a very short half-life outside of the person or the lab that created and collected it. Uh, it hasn't been curated, it hasn't been annotated, you don't know it's going to live in a place for a long time. So there's actually a, a, an economic value as well to making this data available. And this is not something that NSF had to require. Microsoft sees this as a business opportunity. If you Google data market, you get lots and lots of corporate results. Um, I know of at least 10 companies that have been funded by venture capitalists in the last year to do nothing but clean up data and resell it. So there are lots of different mechanisms happening outside of the IRB and outside of the large science funders that are moving towards having data be accessible and reusable. And the question is, do we leave it to them or do we put this into the context of, again, reproducibility and reuse of information? Um, and so the, the, the freedom part that I want to talk about is, as I pointed out in the beginning, not about politics, but about the freedom to reproduce. Um, and it's not obviously biologically, but scientifically. Um, and to go back to, to this little bit about how these things are changing and how they affect your freedom as researchers, um, here's a little arrow, right? Let's just say exercise programs. This is fairly non-controversial, right? We're going to study if, if walking right, affects your cholesterol levels. This should be fairly non-controversial. Now, most of these studies traditionally would happen here at UBC. You would recruit a cohort of people who signed up. You'd put ads on the subway. You'd put ads on the bus. Right? You'd pay people $30 a day to participate in the research study. And you would write a protocol that says, here's what I'm going to do scientifically. And here's how I'm going to prevent re-identification of all the people that were involved. Right? Um, it's a little different now. So this is from last week also. So Fitbit is this little toy that people use if they track themselves, like they obsessively track their physical activity. And it syncs with Google because it's a physical device. It also lets you track your sexual activity because that burns calories. <laughs> it's an exercise activity. So up until about 72 hours ago, Fitbit told the world how often you had sex via Google. Now, if you are a researcher who is not at an institution and you're not bound by an institutional review board, theoretically, you could gather that information and do a retrospective clinical study on how sex affects cholesterol. Right? But it's kind of a privacy issue, right? just a little one. And Fitbit had to go change their API in order to fix this. Right? And this is completely orthogonal right, to this whole open or closed frame. Right? That's not even relevant because we're existing in a world in which it's not about the collection of some massive data set under some set of rules. Right? The data is just out there on the web under very ambiguous terms. And you never know if you collect it to do math on it whether or not you're going to get into trouble. And so freedom to reproduce is, is also about knowing that you have the right to data that you find on the web to do research with. And right now, that's really hard, right? If you decide you want to share under the old school regime, the NSF is happy to let you do that. Right? You go to your IRB and you write a protocol that says, I'm going to make the data available for reproducibility purposes because you collected it. You're in charge. 
But increasingly, the data is going to be out there on the web outside of your collection control. And you need to know whether or not you have the right to do stuff with it. And in particular, do you have the right to let others reproduce your work? Right. I know this guy, Pete Warden, you may have heard of him. He cracked the iPhone tracker, uh, the tracking mechanism. Um, he's also the guy who text mined Facebook to look and see, basically, do your uh, friend relationship networks map to your geographies? And Facebook's reaction when he published his data file and said, here's how you process it on Amazon, was to sue him. Right. He tried to make this graph available for reproducibility purposes, and he got sued which led to this sort of famous quote that data is cheap, lawyers are expensive. <laughs> so he didn't have the freedom to let you reproduce his research because of the terms of service and the privacy conditions that underpin the data set that he created from. And it really boils down to an issue of re-identification blocking your freedom to let other people reproduce your work. And re-identification and privacy are very complicated issues. We don't have time to get remotely into the details of them today. But they cut across the sciences, right? So I showed you Fitbit and sex and clinical review boards, which is usually not what you talk about in a math workshop. I appreciate that. Uh, but it cuts across the sciences. So you know, again, Victoria and I have both been at Berkman at Harvard in our lifetimes. Last week, right? all of these examples are within the last seven days, depressingly. So uh, last week, the Chronicle of Higher Education basically said, you know, these, these Harvard sociologists, again, who, who text mined Facebook, um, they published a data set of 1,700 Facebook profiles that they had used to do their sociology research. And they de-identified it, right? And mathematicians within like 72 hours re-identified everybody. And as I'm assuming most of you are mathematicians, I'm not. I hang out with enough mathematicians to know that you guys can make anything identifiable, as far as I can tell. Uh, as soon as we challenge you by saying something has been identified, you, you identify it. And so these guys wound up in really big trouble because they didn't get the freedom in advance to let other people reproduce their work. Right? Their crime wasn't actually mining Facebook and publishing. Their crime was making their data available to other people to reanalyze. Right? They didn't have the freedom to grant you the right to reproduce their research. So you know, three examples, seven days. Right? Duke doesn't make reproducible research available, people die. Right? Fitbit doesn't even think about this, reveals users' sexual activity to Google. And Harvard researchers get into the news for violating students' privacy. Right? All three of these are bad in very different ways. And all of them relate to the reproducibility question. And so. What I'm going to be working on for the next year or so is how do you get the freedom to let people reproduce your work? And a lot of that is about getting the individuals that are putting their data onto the web or signing up into clinical projects to consent to letting you redistribute your data. And what that means for individuals is consenting to a very uncertain world. Uh, right now, the IRB and clinical review boards have this concept of informed consent that you're going to have a doctor or a physician or a mathematician or someone walk through with me that you're going to take my data about my walking or my sexual activity right, or my Facebook profile. And you're going to teach me the risks that I'm running by participating in the study. Right? We might learn that you have a genetic marker for prostate cancer, which I have. Right? I do know that. You might, we might learn that I have a marker for Alzheimer's disease, which I also know that I have. Right? And we're going to do everything we can to make sure no one ever finds out that it was you that was in the study. Right? That's the old way of doing things. Uh, because we're never going to let anyone reanalyze the data until it's been aggressively de-identified. But the reality is that mathematicians can often re-identify. The reality is that the value comes from linking the databases in ways that facilitates re-identification. And so we've got to come up with some ways to get patients, citizens, data generators who are putting their data on the web to start consenting to this uncertain world that says there's a value to letting researchers make their data reproducible, make their claims reproducible. And that value offsets some of the risks. Right? And that uncertain world we're going into, we don't know what's going to happen when people have the right to reproduce research, uh, for good or for bad, is the world that we want, as opposed to the world that we have, which basically both fails to make research reproducible and fails to protect our privacy. And so this is the sort of thing that, that it's going to look like. 
um, you'll, if, you're, you know, if I'm a patient, I'm going to have to go through and proactively grant rights to do research, rights to redistribute, rights to republish, and even the right to commercialize products based on the research. Right? You need to actually teach and explain this to the sort of people who are putting their Fitbit sex data online uh, if you want to have that data set be redistributable. Right? You've got to understand the impositions you want to impose. Right? So you might not want to be re-identified. Right? So you might want to say that a researcher who downloads the data set has to click a button that says, okay, I agree not to re-identify even though I can. And I agree not to give it to somebody who will re-identify even though they can. Now, that's going to have to be an option because, the, again, the reality is that um, we don't know what re-identification really means, right? Especially in the next five to ten years, if computers keep getting more powerful, quantum computing keeps accelerating, right? Good mathematicians will continue to find ways around this. And the law doesn't create any penalties for people who violate this the way that it does for copyright violations, right? The Britney Spears copyright travels with her music. These obligations won't travel with the data set unless people trust each other. So there's no teeth in the law if you agree not to re-identify me and then you do, right? I can maybe sue you for contract violations, but if you're in Canada and I'm in the United States, I'm basically boned. So this is going to be about trust, and, and this is a trust that doesn't really exist between scientists and the general public because of things like the Duke scandal that, that we just saw. So this is going to be an important part of the reproducibility conversation is to create that trust between scientists and the public that it's worth the trade-off, right? And the scientist is going to actually be accountable. And then most important, that, that I understand the risks, right? Um, that I'm consenting that my data can be used for research. And the reality is if you make your research reproducible, my data travels with that overall data set. I might not be able to go get my data out later. Right? I might be able to pull my data down if I've given it to Randy. He might be able to take it off of his website. But if he's given it to people, they've already got it and it's gone. And we need to teach people who are making their data available about this. This is something that we need to liberate you guys from, not something that you guys need to do. And so just to, to finish, I'll go back to where I started, which is I think that way too often the conversation about open science and, is about political rhetoric of freedom, and it's really not about politics. Um, this is a case where your know, freedom really is about your freedom to redistribute the data that you use for research and know that you're not going to get sued. And so lawyers like to talk about freedom to operate. And in many ways, reproducibility is about two things. It's about making yourself accountable so that your research can be reproduced, and it's about granting freedom to operate to the next generation of scientists that wants to build on your data. And right now, neither of those two things is the standard. So hopefully what comes out of the next two days are some best practices about how to achieve the former. Right? How do you make your data reproducible to make yourself accountable as a scientist? Um, but we don't forget about the latter, which is how do you guarantee that the person who reproduces your research has the right to do that and that you have the right to redistribute everything you need? Thank you. with suing is that anyone can sue anyone for any reason, right? So, uh, what, but what's likely is that there's actually not a train of liability there because if you sign up with Fitbit, you let Fitbit do certain things with your data. You're in charge of the default settings on your Fitbit device and it's your choice whether or not to record your sexual activity on Fitbit, right? It's all voluntary. And then Fitbit has its own deal with Google, which isn't disclosed, where they make certain Fitbit data available. Um, the issue is more that if you're, at a, if you're at a university and you bring shame on the university for having done research, that can affect your career. And so if you, if you were to say, if, if the Fitbit group were to say, we're going to put in place a standardized informed consent process by which people grant certain rights to their data, then you've been pre-cleared, the university risk mitigation has been assured, and you know you've got sort of a clean room of data to work with. 
And so that's, that's sort of my point there is that right now th that problem is really more with Fitbit. But as you get into more sensitive data, typically there will be more complex contracts signed by the users with the data harvesters. So the direct-to-consumer genomics companies are a good example. Uh, you sign a very complex agreement with 23andMe when they sequence your genome, where basically you release them from all liability, and they agree only to sell your data to qualified people and not to, to, to make it available to others. So um, the, I don't think you could get sued for using the Fitbit data yet. Uh, but there may well be, as, as there are more of these breaches, there will be pushes for government to regulate and create liabilities where they don't currently exist. Uh, in the United States right now, we've got a couple of other things happening politically that are sort of preventing any other legislation from happening. But once we get through that, it's very, I think you're going to see privacy come to the forefront fairly quickly. So, um, in the case of uh, Harvard research, So the question is about uh, the, the Harvard Facebook data uh, issue. The crime was in sort of redistributing the data set, not harvesting it. So there was a, vi I believe there may have been a violation of the terms of service of Facebook and the harvesting of the data, but that's between the researchers and Facebook, right? Just like between Pete Warden and Facebook. So Facebook, Facebook could sue you for violating their terms of service, but increasingly Facebook is starting to understand that making their data available for research purposes is actually not a bad idea. It makes the graph more valuable to annotate it, not less. Uh, and so they dropped their lawsuit against Pete. Right? Facebook, as far as I know, hasn't sued the Harvard researchers. Um, and you can apply to Facebook for permission to do research. Right? Because Facebook's in charge of their own terms of service. But if you make your research reproducible out of Facebook, right, then third parties who never had a deal with Facebook can re-identify individuals through their Facebook profiles very, very quickly. And so that's, that's where, you know, the article wasn't about, you know, Facebook sues Harvard researchers. It was Harvard researchers breach students' privacy. And that makes institutions really, really nervous. So presumably Harvard has some sort of permission for Facebook to do it in the first place. Yeah, I think so. I think so. You know, the Berkman Center can make a phone call and get to whoever they want in Silicon Valley pretty quickly. So I'm assuming they actually had permission from Facebook to do this. Right, but they, they decided to make their data set available so that you could do more research on it. And then, you know, again, very, very quickly, the students whose profiles had been crawled were getting emails and phone calls, right, from other mathematicians and from the press saying, you know, how does it feel to be identified in a data set created by Harvard Did you, you know, when you didn't give any permission? So you could imagine if, if you had a, uh, you know, think how viral things go on Facebook. Imagine if you had... Uh, a page that said consent to have your Facebook data available for research purposes. And you had to spend eight to ten minutes going through, clicking a few buttons, watching a video. Because right? you actually want people to be informed. You don't want this to be a bullshit process. Uh, but you've got, what, 650 million Facebook users? If half of a percent of them did this, you would have an incredibly rich data set for sociology that was pre-cleared, right? that you could redistribute. Um, and right now that doesn't exist. So that's, that's the sort of thing that we're trying to create now. So one, um, I mean, I don't know if anybody else has ever actually read the terms of service when they click, you know, you load on some piece of software, you actually just sort of, you know, click I agree and then move, move on. Right? Mm -hmm. um, is there any concern that even if you do try to inform um, participants in a research and study by having them read through something like this that they still might not actually really be informed about what they're doing? Yeah. So yeah, the, this is the, if it didn't be, get picked up, the question is, are you, do you really get informed consent when you get informed consent in a click-through process? Um, who knows, right? Uh, pharmaceutical companies are experimenting with electronic consent. Uh, I think the issue is less one of law than one of user interface. And so um, the specific project I'm referring to is, is happening uh, with Sage Bionetworks, the, the, the medical research nonprofit. And the design of the legal consents is actually the easy part, right? The vast majority of the budget is to pay a design firm to create 
a, a workflow and a user interface um, that maximizes the chances that someone who completes the process is actually informed. So you have to make affirmative clicks, right? There's a lot of research that shows every click you have to make eliminates people who don't pay attention. So it's not going to be sort of okay, I agree, right, to my 92 pages iTunes terms of service. But, um, you know, click I understand, click I want, you know, a, a video that you cannot fast forward and you can't get to the next screen until it's played. Right? So you can get up and walk away, you can turn off your audio, but those are fairly active things to do. Um, and the hope is that at the end of this process, you'll, you'll actually have something that has a reasonable shot at the same level of informed consent that you get when you talk to a clinician in a hurry for five minutes. And, you know, we're doing this actually through an IRB. We're going to make sure that we have multiple IRBs sign off on this, both from the perspective of whoever offers the process, because it's going to be a standard. You'll be able to drop this into any website you want, right, and say, uh, if you're going to gather data, you can put this process in place. It'll be free, like a web standard. So we're going to have IRBs that sign off on offering this, as well as IRBs that sign off on consuming it. And so the goal is to have some old school institutions say, we believe this creates informed consent. So we're going to let our scientists offer this tool. And we believe this creates informed consent, so we're going to let our scientists consume data collected under it. And if you can get a couple of the right institutions to sign off on that, I think you'll see a domino effect pretty quickly of saying, this is a much more realistic way of generating at least a lightweight form of consent. So you might not want this on your genome. Right? You might, right, if you're sick or if you're part of a, a population, but you might not if you're not sick, right? Uh, but on your Facebook data, on lots of the sorts of data that's out there in the general individual exhaust world, this is a lot better than, than what, what, what exists right now. So that's what we're hoping to do. We, want, we do want some old school sign off and butt covering. Yeah, I have a question about the do, the do trial. Uh, so, I, I, you know, it's, I've been following this a long time, and uh, I actually kind of wonder now whether that was really the problem there with reproducibility. I mean, the, you know, the only reason we know a lot of details about the trial is because they actually did make their data available to certain people, not generally, but certain people. And now and then, you know, they you know, keep, you know, keep back and kind of doing some, <coughs> all these mistakes and you know, things like that. And so, um, and that's, that was a long time ago that they found these things. And yet, you know, some various studies kind of went through. And so I wonder whether or not was, the problem was that the studies, the original studies were not reproducible, or whether it was just kind of, rather just kind of bad science marching forward. I think that's such a good, so the point was on the Duke trials that the problem not was, was not reproducibility, but bad science. So I agree, actually. Uh, the, the reason I use it is as an example of a cultural problem which is that we have a culture of, we get an interesting result and we race forward to commercialize it without stopping to reproduce it and, and validate it first. And so if we had a culture in which the statisticians get first whack, right, and then the next paper gets published, right, that's a lot better than these guys having to sort of fight their way through it. People didn't want to listen to them, right? People at Duke in particular didn't want to listen to these, to these answers. And so a culture that says it's not real until it's been reproduced externally, right, uh, would have had a significant slowing effect on racing this product to market. So this is, this is if, so A, if the data is available to everybody, the odds of it being reproduced quickly go up, and the odds of finding the mistakes quickly go, da uh, go up. Uh, and B, as a cultural thing, if you sort of don't believe something until it's been reproduced, especially something that's as important as this, then you can mitigate the harm to people. So I, I use this more as, I, I think reproducibility is more of a vaccination against bad science, and that's why I raise that as, as, as the first point. But I think your, your point's very well taken. Okay, let's, let's thank John again.